Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Wine Vine virtual tasting. Today's special is a New York Drinks New York holiday special. Uh, we're tasting four wines that were selected as part of a New York Drinks New York alum, Mike Faircloth, his store, Vinyl Wines, uh, was having a special. And so we are tasting those four wines. Hopefully some of you took advantage of the savings we sent out and were able to get these wines to taste along with us. Um, my name is Julie Papura Hasbach and I'm the Education and Member Services Manager at the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. Thrilled to have you joining us today. Uh, for those of you that are brand new to our series, we usually meet every fourth Sunday of the month and we taste through a different varietal. We'll talk through all the different techniques of appreciation, fun facts about the wine. Uh, usually we taste wines from three different regions of New York State. and. You can at any point in time ask questions, type comments into the chat bar. So if you're new to Zoom and the, if you mouse over your screen, you should be able to find um, a Q&A section and also a chat bar feature. So please feel free to put your comments on um, and, and be as participative. We love hearing um, feedback and comments and all. There's no such thing as a stupid question. So please uh, join right in with us. Um, I'm a certified sommelier through the Court of Master Sommeliers. I am a WSET3 certified um, and a certified specialist, specialist of wine through the Society of Wine Educators, which basically means I'm a huge wine nerd and I love talking about wine with people and tasting and appreciating wines with people. And today I'm especially thrilled to have my colleague Paul Brady, who's our New York Wine Brand Ambassador, joining us, who's also an experienced sommelier. Um, and he's going to add a lot. He oversees our New York Drinks New York program with our other colleague, Jen Cooper. So he has lots to share about these wines too. So we're super excited to get started. Um, I will send a copy of the recording out, so you're welcome to, hopefully you got our tasting sheet ahead of time that I emailed out with the link. Uh, you're welcome to take notes alongside with us, um, or you can just sit back, relax, enjoy, and we'll send out a copy of the recording, usually in about 24 hours from when we finish today. So, let's get tasting. Today we're going to be starting with Boundary Breaks 239 Dry Riesling. Hopefully you all have this bottle. Boundary Breaks is located on the east side of Seneca Lake in the Finger Lakes. So remember, basic wine appreciation, and if you're joining us for the first time, you want to tip your glass at a roughly 45 degree angle, preferably hold it up against a white backdrop, look at the color, look at what color it is, is it clear versus cloudy? Remember, white wines tend to get more darker and golden as they age. Um, red wines tend to get lighter and more British color as they age. Also, the color can be a sign of the grape skins, the grape variety themselves. So certain uh, grape varieties have different thickness and thinness levels of the skins. It's clear, we would probably call this pale straw. It's a very light, right? So again, if you wanna use your box and take notes, you can, or just continue along with us. Next, you want to make sure you swirl your swirl the wine so that we can get lots of aromatics and take several inhalations, several big sniffs, and just start sharing what you smell. I definitely get a lot of lime. <clears throat> you. Super, super clean and crisp aromatic wine for sure. A lot of those very common Riesling aromatics. Yeah, still true. slime, yeah. a little bit of like green apple baking spice. And that like wet rock limestone smell, you know, makes you think you're just outside, as you said, so fresh. If we were in any sort of exam setting that had to do with blind tasting Rieslings from this part of the country, I think we would be very happy to get this wine. It is very, Classic. very much Riesling, very much screaming Riesling in a good way. All right, anybody else have any other comments they want to throw in? Are we getting anything especially unique? All right, go ahead and taste it. So remember, when we talk about appreciating wine and we taste it, we're looking at various structural elements. So 
basic structural elements of a wine. If you're brand new to us, I, for those of you that are frequent flyers with us, um, feel free to add in and comment in. But mostly what we talk about uh, for structural elements of a wine are acidity, tannins, which is a mouth drying component, uh, a textural element that generally is associated or mostly found in red wines because it comes from the skin, seeds, and stems of a grape skin, and red wines ferment on their skins. Um, it also can come from oak barrels, so you can maybe find it in a white, but we wouldn't find it in a, this Riesling. So acidity is like biting into a lemon. Your mouth waters, your jaw tenses. Uh, if you tucked your chin in to your chest, you'd have the propensity to drool. Now typically Rieslings characteristically have high acidity as do cool climate wines. It's part of what makes them so super food friendly and mouth watering delicious. Um, so this would be an example of high acidity if we were talking about acidity. And again, we're not gonna talk about tannins. The next structural element we would talk about is sweetness or the absence of, which is called dry. And I guess I probably already gave it away when I said that this is dry Riesling, but according to the International Riesling Foundation scale, anything under 1% residual sugar is considered dry. One to 2% is off dry, two to four is medium sweet, and then anything above 4% would be considered sweet. So this is under 1% residual sugar. There's probably just a touch there to balance out some of that high crisp acidity. Beautifully balanced wine. Um, the last structural element, so again, we're gonna call this, this is a dry wine. And then um, alcohol is sometimes perceived as a warming sensation. So if you feel no warming sensation or maybe a teeny bit in your nose, generally the, the alcohol content is less than 10%. If you feel maybe a warming sensation in your throat, it's usually 10 to 12%. And if you feel a warming sensation in your chest, it's usually above 12, 12.5%. This might take some practice, and so if you're joining us for the first time, you know, don't be shy, but also you'll learn and get better with it. I would definitely guess that this is probably like around 11, 12 percent. I was definitely feeling it in my throat. That would be my guess. We can take a look at the bottle. And then the body um, of a wine is, the best way to think about body is to equate it to milk. So is it like skim? 1%, 2% whole milk, you know, what's the weight on your tongue? And this, what, what does everybody think this one is? The comments, if any are coming in. Um, I would definitely say that this is a light bodied wine, more like that skim in terms of weight. And if you have the bottle in front of you, if you took a look at the back, you'd see it's 11.5% alcohol. So we were pretty spot on with our guess. Anybody have any questions or comments they want to share about this Boundary Breaks Riesling? Paul, do you have any interesting side notes you want to add? Sure. If, um, if you haven't had a chance to visit Boundary Breaks, there are few people in the wine world more serious about their vineyard. It, it's, um, it's a really quite visually spectacular site. Um, the, the vines, the soils on that particular site are heavy in clay, so they're what you would call water retentive soils and, and the Boundary Breaks team does a great job in their vineyard managing that, managing the drainage and, and uh, everything that's important with that soil type. Uh, and this style in particular, this wine is made by Kelby Russell. Uh, so Boundary Breaks is a sort of a vineyard first winery and this then was produced down the street at Red Newt by Kelby. And the style that they go for is a little bit almost, uh, if we were in Germany, you would call it either that Cabinet Trocken or Spatlese Trocken. So basically a late harvest pick, then fin vinified entirely dry. So going for that nice rich texture from the late harvest ripening, but then vinifying all the way dry to make it a dry wine. So it's, it's powerful Riesling, it's very refreshing. It's got some backbone to it and should go with just about anything. Yeah, I was just to say, I wish we had food with us tasting right now because that screams food friendly. So when you're thinking about uh, your holiday food 
upcoming dinners and what wines to pair with them. Again, Riesling in general is a super food friendly wine, partly because it's so versatile um, and it has high acidity. So acidity acts as a conductor of flavors in your food as well as it's refreshing and cleanses your mouth and gets you excited and ready for more. So I always recommend Rieslings. Um, some guidelines to keep in mind to help you think about your wine and food pairings is you want to match the weight of the wine to the weight of the food. So you want to match more light to medium bodied wines with you know, probably more your seafood and maybe poultry dishes and your heavy, robust, full-bodied wines with, you know, your more heavy weight laden uh, dishes. In general, that's one rule of thumb. There's a lot of guidelines to wine and food pairings, so there's no one right or wrong answer. Um, Riesling, as we said, is also super aromatic um, and lends itself particularly well in my experience. I love pairing it, as we said, it had so much lime, so I love pairing it with appetizers that particularly have lime and cilantro. Basil or anything that has a lot of herbs is really great with it. Seafood's really great with Riesling. Um, but another guideline for food is you want your wine to be as sweet or sweeter than the food. Otherwise, it makes, um, if you eat something really sweet and then have a dry wine, it can make it taste all inside. It'd be kind of like brushing your teeth and then having orange juice. Yes, that horrible mental image <laughs> that my mother made me do when I was a kid uh, is not fun, right? So um, you, if you are having a dish, that has some sweetness in it, like maybe it's a sweet marinade or um, a salsa that has some sweetness. Or if you have something that's really spicy, you want to counteract that or really salty. A Riesling or a wine that is maybe more off dry or semi-sweet would might be a better pair because that will help um, either balance the saltiness or spiciness or counteract the sweetness. So if you're looking to try something new, maybe um, you want to experiment with that, but this in and of itself would be a great food pairing wine. Uh, any, without any questions, we'll go on to our next wine, which is going to be Nathan Kendall's Pinot Noir. So go ahead and again, tilt your glass at a 45 degree angle. Take a look at the color. So usually with red wines, we say Ruby or maybe Ruby Garnet or Ruby Plum. This one's pretty dead on Ruby to me. It's a nice light Ruby. Pinot Noirs in general are a little lighter in color because Pinot Noir has very thin skins. It's clear, not cloudy, just because it has color. More color intensity does not mean it's cloudy. Cloudy would look like milk, like protein. Uh, it's things that make, what makes a cloudy wine are protein molecules. Um, so just imagine more like the consistency of milk rather than see through. So go ahead, swirl and smell your wine. Another beautifully aromatic wine. Get much more earthiness out of this wine. And red fruit, red berries. I get cherries, strawberry. Definitely get those baking spices in this one. Almost a little bit of like um, tar or rubber cement that Another. plays nicely with the red fruits. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments, aromas that anybody else is picking up? Go ahead and taste it. <coughs> So again, as you're taking the, your first sip or two, pay attention to, again, acidity is mouth watering, jaw tensing. Now in this example, since we're having red wine fermented on the skins, we have tannins, which are mouth drying texture. It makes you want a glass of water. So acidity and tannins are kind of opposite uh, or feel opposite, do opposite things in your mouth and they balance each other out really nicely. Um, so in terms of acidity, that mouth watering, <coughs> Um, jaw tensing, like biting into a lemon, that's acidity. If we were evaluating this against the world of wines, low, medium, high, what does everybody think? It's pretty think? high. Yeah, so again, we're still in a cool climate. Pinot Noir can have good acidity. I wouldn't say it's quite as high as the Riesling, um, but definitely at least the medium, if not medium, plus acidity. And 
tannins in the world line. So obviously the, the Riesling that we said didn't have tannins. This one, you do feel that mouth coating compared to, you know, the world of wines and some Cabernet Sauvignons or Shiraz or Malbecs that typically have very high levels of tannins. This is, I would say it's probably more a medium level of tannins. It's just nice smooth coating, but beautiful texturally like velvet. Just creates that smooth mouthfeel. Would you say it's dry in the middle or sweet? Don't let, on the note of sweetness, don't let your nose deceive you. So sometimes when we smell, um, especially in Rieslings, when we smell lots of fruit, but again, in any wine, where you smell lots of fruit or you smell sweet things, your brain might trick you into thinking that a wine is sweet because 85 to 90% of what we taste is from our sense of smell. So if you're ever not positive and in the sake of wine education, wine appreciation, and learning. If you plug your nose and take a sip of wine, keep your nose plugged the entire time, you'll actually be able to detect whether it actually has any sugar. So go ahead if you weren't sure. And if you didn't get it before, hopefully plugging your nose helped you see that this is a dry wine, even though it had lots of fruit in the nose and some sweet baking spice aromatics. It's a dry wine. And then body. Again, think back to skim milk, 1%, 2% whole milk. Where do you think the body is on this wine? More than the Riesling, but again, in the world of wine, I wouldn't say full, so I'd say maybe a medium body. Yep. Um, so this is a 2017 Pinot Noir. We should probably mention that the Riesling for Boundary Breaks was 2018. 2018 was a very challenging vintage, so Pats on the back to all our vignerons and, and viticulturists who were involved in the 2018 vintage. Uh, no matter what the challenge, they made some outstanding wines for us. 2017, a little bit different. It was a bit mild and rainy in July and August, but then the sun came out in September for a really, really nice finish. Produced a lot of wine that year. I like the red wines, how they're drinking right now at an early age. They've got this nice sort of snappy pop to it from that sort of light body and nice refreshing acidity. This is a blend of two different vineyard sites <clears throat> from around Seneca Lake. One on the east side, which is light and frost, and one on the west side, which is taller. Light and frost is more rocky as far as soils. Taller is more sandy, so they sort of have a nice tension push-pull, which ends up being a very harmonious blend and I think gives the wine its structure and personality. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, definitely two great examples um, of bigger lakes, a white and red that are also both super food friendly and would be great for your holiday. Again, both would be great with turkey if you're having that. Uh, if you're having ham, they both could work. I would recommend maybe something with a teeny bit of residual sugar just because ham is so salty. But if you're looking for a red pinot, it would be a great example. Um, alcohol content, does anybody want to guess where they're feeling that warming sensation? Definitely, I think a little bit higher than the Riesling. I'm feeling a little bit more in my chest. I would guess like 12.5, maybe 13. Let's see. It is 12. So they do have a little bit of wiggle room too. And I should have shown the bottle. Hopefully you all have this at home in front of you. But as we went on to taste it, this is the label and the bottle. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or other comments? All right, we're going to move on to, what do you want to taste next, Paul? Let's taste some bubbles. Okay, and I apologize, we did go a little bit out of order from your tasting sheet. So we started with the Boundary Breaks Riesling, then we went to the Nathan Kendall Pain Noir. <laughs> now we're going to <laughs> have a party. It's not, it's not a party until you have bubbles. Uh, <laughs> All right, rock and roll. So now we're having Atwater's Pet Nat of La Francish. La Francish also is called Lemberger in some areas of the world. So typically Lemberger is the name in Germany, La Francish in Austria. And in the Finger Lakes, we see examples of both names. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Uh, so take a look at this glass. So this one, you can see that little bit more of cloudy and 
cloudy, again, it's just protein molecules. There's nothing wrong with drinking a wine that has some cloudiness to it. This, I would say, is like a more ruby plum color. It just means it didn't necessarily go through as many clarification steps in the winemaking. And again, this is from Atwater. Atwater Estate. And a lot of Finger Lakes are just starting, not just starting, I should take that back. Uh, more and more Finger Lakes wineries are producing Blanc Franche slash Lundberger. Um, and I think it is one, I don't know if you'd agree, Paul, that we might continue to see more planted of and more producers making it. I think it's a pretty safe bet that we may see an increase in acreage uh, over the years of Blanc Franche or Lundberger, whatever you prefer. And All right, so what just happened there? Let's talk about Yeah, that. let's talk about cutting out and being explosions. <laughs> so <laughs> we are going all in on bubbles here this morning. Uh, so Petion Naturel, or Petnat for short, is a sparkling wine process sometimes referred to as the method ancestral. And so how this differs from champagne or other forms of sparkling wine technique is what happens is uh, the, the, the grapes are pressed, the juice begins fermenting in tank or another vessel, and then is transferred into bottle while it's still fermenting. And then it finishes that fermentation in bottle, trapping some CO2, which is eventually released in the form of bubbles. Uh, and that wine can, the wine in bottle, as it finishes its fermentation, can finish all the way dry, or sometimes with a little bit of residual sugar left over. Um, in this case, uh, let's let's talk about uh, natural wine a little bit. So, Atwater, uh, Vinny Alperdi, and George Gnosis. This is a project of George. Um, George, uh, this he told me that this is all wild yeast fermented, no sulfur added, uh, and not disgorged, not fine, not filtered. All the all the good natural wine stuff. That, right, so that's back to why natural wine cloudy. is like, yeah. and which is why it's cloudy and sometimes. Uh, it's probably our fault for maybe not having the wine cold enough, which is why it uh, was like New Year's Eve upon opening. But we just um, wanted to make sure you were really in the celebration spirit. Yeah. <laughs> spirit. With some of these uh, pet nets and uh, wines made in this style, you get a little bit of bottle variation, and sometimes uh, that can happen when you're opening. So definitely make sure to have the bottle cold enough. That's going to help. And, and and back to just explain, if you're joining us for the first time, we've talked about this in, in, in previous tastings, but the basic alcoholic fermentation equation is sugar from the grapes plus yeast, which can be wild or they can be cultured and added and selected by the winemaker, equal our wine plus carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide is our, you know, form of bubbles. Hopefully you're getting bubbles, but sorry, Paul, I just... Uh, help clarify this whole winemaking process. That's kind of the basic winemaking in a nutshell scientific equation. What does everybody smell in this one? And can you talk to Paul um, why maybe Atwater chose Blau Frankish? Because I've, I've not seen Blau Frankish uh, pet nat, I don't think yet, and many other producers. <coughs> So you'll find pet nets from all sorts of different grapes. Um, uh, there are there are pet nets of Merlot, of Cabernet Franc, of Pinot Noir, of Blanc Franc. There's certainly white grapes around the area. You'll see pet net from Riesling, Riesling yeah. from okay. Cayuga, from Leon Mio, from uh, Noire. All sorts of different people are using different grapes. It's kind of just choice of the winemaker. Uh, in this case, I think that Blanc Franc or Lemberger has a really nice, it's a nice grape to, to get some bubbles in there. The sort of tart kind of raspberry flavors with that little bit of earthiness, yeah. um, acidity, plays nicely with bubbles. Yeah. So what is everybody else getting in the aroma? I get some plum too. A nice blend of fruit, like that fruit savory combination. Sweet and savory in the nose for sure. <clears throat> have definitely a little bit of earthiness in there too. So the Atwater Vineyard is on the south east side of Seneca Lake and this is a sort of this block comes from a variation of another silt loam soil type. 
Uh, it's a very ripe site. They do grow quite a few different red grapes there, Cabernet Franc, Pinot Noir, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon even, among others, and of course, Bla Francish. And quite delicious. I know it has been, it has done well um, in the Vinyl Wine Club and in the shop there. And George makes some other projects like this a little bit. He, I know he had another pet net. He has a skin contact blend of Chardonnay and Diverse Terminer. And then of course, um, all the other sort of more classic labels at Atwater is up for years. Yeah, got a question. Yeah, question. Can you read it first? Yep. Paula would like to know, um, she wants to go over what PetNat stands for again. Sure. I think she's ever seen so it. So PetNat uh, is short for Petillon Naturel. Petillon meaning just sparkling or bubbly in French. Natural meaning natural. So it's... Uh, That's the spelling of it. It's, it's literally translates to naturally bubbly. And again, there's a more sort of uh, scientific name known as method ancestral in French again and it, it's the exact same method the wine starts fermenting in a vessel and it's then put into bottle where it finishes and becomes bubbly that differs from champagne and how the champagne method works in that a base wine is made fully fermented that wine is then goes through a second fermentation in bottle based on another addition of, a, of yeast and sugar, which causes that second fermentation to happen. So essentially, the difference is champagne goes through two fermentations, pet nut typically becomes bubbly as a result of one fermentation. So but there are um, other methods to make wine sparkling as well. Right. It doesn't stop there. We talked about it in our, for those people who joined us for our sparkling wine tasting that we had in July, we talked about the tank method and uh, we definitely went into more detail on the traditional method champenois or champagne method, but thank you all so much for explaining Petit Natural or Pet Nat as we say for short. It is becoming, I think, more of a popular trend and you can find more and more of these, I would say, in liquor stores than you've ever had before. Um, in terms of structural elements, as Paul said, you know, this is fun, fruity. I definitely think this is a great way to start your holiday celebration. Um, in terms of structural elements, acidity, I would say is medium, you know, definitely yeah, medium to almost high. Yeah. yeah. Um, it does have just a teeny bit of tannins, because again, it's still a red wine, so you get a little bit, but you don't feel it as much. Might be a low level. Um, and sweetness, dry, middle, sweet. This one I would say is just a touch off dry. A touch. Just a touch. Perhaps, yeah. I think it's, if it's um, so in the world of sparkling, you can have up to 1.5% residual sugar and still be labeled brute, which is, or dry, which Brute is dry in the sparkling world, so. And of course, with Pet Nat, none of those rules apply. Seems like it's a, uh, a world-breaking wine all the way around, kind of. <laughs> um, and then body. What do you think the body is? Medium. Yeah, definitely have some, some texture there. And the bubbles, bubbles make for a great food pairing wine. In general, um, bubbles like excite and cleanse your palate and get you salivating and wanting more. So, you know, bubbly is the classic celebration wine. It's also a classic um, palate cleansing wine. It's great with all sorts of appetizers and but really sparkling wine should be consumed with food way more often. It should not be just saved for celebrations or special occasions. Um, I think it's super food friendly. And Fried foods, yeah. foods. Sushi. Foods. Sparkling and sushi. My like favorite Salt. pairing of all time. <laughs> Salt. Anybody have any other questions or comments on our Blanc Francish Pet Nap from Atwater Estate? All right. So the last time we're going to taste today, we actually had this lovely little rainbow of wines in this package. So you had a white, a red, uh, a reddish bubbly, and now we're going to have an orange wine. Thank you, Paul. So orange wines are another kind of trending wine right now, and this is Cuca Lake Vineyards. Um, Amber Vignon, which is a hybrid grape, and uh, the winemaker at Cuca Lake Vineyards is Stacy Nugent, who does some amazing examples of Vignon. Um, orange wines are a winemaking technique, so it's making, so usually back to winemaking 101, so white wines usually get pressed immediately and fermented off the skins. Red wines generally ferment on the skins and then are pressed off their skins, thus they get the color contact, tannins, etc. Orange wines are basically making white wine like a red wine. And so they don't have 
as much you know color extraction from the skins as or pigment to make a red wine but you definitely see the difference between the Riesling that was produced like traditional white wine making where the grapes are pressed off the skins initially before fermentation versus this amber mignol which is an orange wine and had skin fermentation so we're going to taste some of those attributes but you know certainly you can see that this color is more of a orangey hue clear wine go ahead and swirl and smell if you're already ahead of me what do we smell in this wine Grapefruit? Yeah, definitely citrus. And like grapefruit peel, for sure. Definitely get a lot of citrus, grapefruit and orange. Also lots of like, kind of like yellow apple rind, kind of like when you bite the white middle part of it, a yellow apple. And definitely lots of grapefruit, black pepper, yeah, there's a spicy element it's that I wasn't expecting. Black pepper. Like, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting. That's why one of the reasons that people like this style of wine is sort of its intensity of aromatics. Super intense, yeah. I feel like it's almost like ginger. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, like that baking. Ginger and then almost like a nectarine, fig, really lots fig, of orchard fruit and. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Yeah, we had across the board beautifully aromatic wines, like uniquely, distinctly different as we've gone through them all, but in nice, intense aromatics. Beautiful. Got a question? Question. Robert Ketchum would like to know what makes the color orange when the skins are green. You want to take this one or you want me to? Okay. Excellent question. Um, so, though that, it, though we call white wine, white wine, as it is almost clear, they actually come from skins that are generally greenish to sometimes colorless. colorless. So that's why I said back in the original, when we started looking at wines, sometimes you can tell the color. Rieslings are generally very light, almost watery, because they have very little pigment in their skins. But when we make an orange wine and we ferment on the skins, usually there actually is color pigment. So um, especially like with Pinot Gris, which I think is often made into an orange wine, it actually has like grayish orange skins. And so from far away, they may appear green or they might even look greenish. They really actually have, depending on the variety, <clears throat> the Vignol and the Rich Demeanor and Pinot Gris all have like a actual pinkish grayish hue usually. And that's part of what translates into the orange wine. Yeah, I mean, without really fully understanding color chemistry and, and, and all of that, what, what you're essentially seeing is Vignol that the juice is pressed from the middle of the grape that has then spent time with its skins. It'd be, if you saw a vignole that didn't spend any time with the skins, that would look like a very clear white wine. So what Julie was saying, similarly, grape like Pinot Grigio or Gewurztraminer even, these are grapes that we associate with white wines, but they actually have pinkish skins. So if you were to look at Gewurztraminer or Pinot Grigio on a vine, it's not a white grape. And so if you were to make a skin contact wine out of those grapes, it's going to have a pinkish or amber color, just like this video. This video. Good question. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Excellent. Anybody else have any questions or comments? We can go back to those structural elements. And so this is also, we should point out, the first wine from grapes made from a different lake other than Seneca. Starting with the Bounty Breaks, those grapes were all from the east side of Seneca Lake. The Pinot Noir from Nathan Kay, that was a blend of both east and west side. The Blau Frankish Petnat from uh, Atwater, that's down on the southeast side of Seneca Lake. Now we're on Cuca Lake. This is a blend of two different vineyards from the east side of Cuca Lake as well. Cuca Lake Vineyards is situated on the west side where they have a vineyard there as well. 
and then they have two other vineyards on the east side of Seneca, uh, Cuca Lake. Cuca Lake is a little further west than Seneca, yep. Um, so, acidity, mouth-watering, jaw-tensing, again, pretty, I'd say medium plus to high acidity on this wine. Um, it's a cool climate. Vignol typically has medium plus to high acidity. Raging high acidity yeah. in Vignol. And it's hard to get higher than the Vignol grape in terms of acidity. And that's one of the reasons that it can make a lot of different styles of grapes. All the way sweet, dessert wine, uh, classic still white wine, orange wine or amber or skin contact like you're seeing today. And, and actually, like Vineyards has a new sparkling version of Vignol as well now. Ooh, I have not tried that yet. I'll have to add that to my list, wish list. Um, so yeah, Vignol has high acidity, pretty much. This, this one does have a high acidity and generally, typically Vignols do. And they actually have a, if you didn't try it for Thanksgiving, you might want to try it with your turkey. It's called Turkey Run Vignol, but it, it is a great, food pairing. Uh, again, food friendly, lots of acid to try for your holiday plate. Um, in terms of tannins, so did you feel that, you know, coating on your um, tongue and teeth, did you feel the texture elements of tannins like we did in the red wines that, um, especially more like the Pinot Noir, like this definitely has, you can feel those tannins, right? Yeah, if you didn't have another sip and you'll for sure notice it. Yeah. No as compared to the Riesling. And you can, if you are at home having all these wines, you can easily go back and compare the difference between the two. I always recommend having two glasses for comparative sake. Um, when you're tasting, make sure you taste as best you can. So let's talk about tasting order because we came in hot and we did change the order. So generally, it's really important generally to taste dry to sweet. But then you have to factor in other things like tannins. And we knew that this orange wine would be uniquely different and just fun to talk about, and then bubbles cleanse your palate in between. So that's how we ended up in the order we do today. Um, you know, if, if you were doing drastically different sweetness levels, you would definitely want to go dry to sweet. Do you generally tell people way before red because of tannins? Um, no, I don't because I, I myself, I, I often, if, if I'm tasting sort of for assessing purposes, I like to finish with white wines because I like to finish with acid. Yeah. So I like to finish with higher levels of acidity. So it's sort of I save that to the end and that the acidity kind of cleanses uh, my palate as I'm, as I'm tasting. So in tasting, I do like to start with lower acid or even reds, um, but with, you know, when you're eating food, honestly, I, I would put all these wines on the table and just yeah. let everybody these were all, grab and go for whichever one they want. These were all pretty, if not dry, very close to dry, and they all had high Pretty much, medium and you could, of course, you could design an entire taste for course tasting menu around these, these four wines, wines. Yeah. the savory food, and, and pair them very intricately. But you don't have to do that. They're they're just enjoy the they're wine. very yeah. versatile, and and it's one of the great things about New York State that we can produce these food friendly, high acid wines. Yeah, in general, not only is it awesome to drink New York wines because they're delicious and they are local and supporting local, but they also are amazing with food. Um, they've gotten really very food friendly. Uh, so it was dry, just to finish our structural elements. That one did not have sugar, right? It was dry. And I would say like medium, medium minus body on it. Does anybody want to guess the alcohol content of this one? Now that you're uh, getting more pro level uh, through our practice, it's our last one. It's around 12. Wow, 10-3. Last one. And that was a 2018. 2018. So young, and that was a cool year. So typically, relatively cool year. We had pretty high acidity levels in 2018 across the board. A lot of rain. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any questions or thoughts about any of these wines or any questions for Paul or I about upcoming what you're having? You know, we kind of wanted to leave time to open it up if you have any questions about New York wines, uh, these wines in particular, pairing wine and food. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments that they want to share with us? Um, I do want to say before we get into questions and before I forget, don't forget our normally scheduled wine, uh, wine buying virtual tasting series is for this Sunday at 4 p.m. December 22nd at 4 p.m. I will be sending the Zoom link out tomorrow to everybody who's registered for it. We are tasting Cabernet Sauvignons for the uh, first time in our tasting series. Again, we started this tasting series in June and each 
uh, month we focus on a different varietal. We will be tasting Liberty Vineyards and Winery Cabernet Sauvignon from Lake Erie region, Brotherhood uh, Winery Cabernet Sauvignon, which is located in the Hudson Valley, does source some of its grapes from Long Island, and then the Lens Winery 2013 Cabernet Sauvignon from Long Island. Um, so more to come on that, but I wanted you to save the date. Any questions? Any else, any comments? Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to share about this wine talk? No, I would just say, you know, if you're interested in these wines and you weren't able to get a hold of these exact bottles, if you're in New York City area, these are available on vinyl wines, except for the Boundary Breaks Riesling that uh, we did find out that that recently sold out there, um, but the other three are still there. If you're up here in the region and, you, and, you're, and you're looking around, you can always Google, go on to Wine Searcher. Um, it's a great tool for, for finding these, for wines that you're looking for in various shops. Otherwise, just call the wineries up. Yeah, I was going to say, they all sell them on their website. Yeah. So all of these wineries you can order from. Go online or, or, or call them up. If, yeah. if they're out of any of them, then you might ask, okay, what's another thing that you have that I might like? Yeah. Um, so, yep, yeah, just what never hesitate. I can't tell you how many times as a wine buyer for restaurants or shops or as, even as a consumer, how many times I picked up the phone just to call wineries. And if you're able, no matter where you live in your state, to go visit wineries, maybe over the holiday break, you want to plan a visit, certainly I think the experience to the tasting room is worth it every single time and to taste the whole, whole lineup they have to offer. I think the best way to learn about what you like is not only through fun tastings like this, but also to just keep trying. So your homework assignment is to drink as many New York wines with as many meals as possible and keep learning and discovering what, what works for you. Uh, wine food pairing is definitely you know, subjective, just like wine tasting is. And so um, there aren't any hard, fast rules. There's just guidelines that that'll help you enjoy. And I'm always happy if you have any, if you think of anything afterwards, feel free to email me. Um, Amy, would you mind typing my email address in the chat bar so everybody has it, um, as well as my phone number. Please contact, send us any comments or feedback if you have any. Thanks so much for joining us today. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank and you. yeah, hopefully see you Sunday. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.